Morning, everybody. Um, basically, it's within the next 20 minutes, I'm going to canter through fairly rapidly the, the paper that I've done, which is about fair and increased peacekeepers, um, which, is, from my point of view, ties into the symposium from the uh, perspective of working in conflict and affected environments. And really, it's just a quick look at the history um, behind um, why we've got to where we are today with it, um, a little bit about practicalities and how it came about. Um, what is currently there and what of the future. So, um, if you look at police peacekeeping and its history, um, it, it is fairly straightforward. Um, there wasn't a great need for training police peacekeepers because actually what they did was they went out and did very similar sort of things to what they did in their domestic environments. They monitored, they reported, um, uh, and uh, generally, um, sort of looking at the early deployments pre-Cold War, um, there wasn't too much that was thought to be that necessary as, as far as training was concerned, um, and therefore it didn't really happen. Um, it was with the post-Cold War environment um, that the changes really started to occur. Um, and why was that? Well, I suspect, again, internationally there was a rise in specialisation within policing. Um, it was no longer just the, um, the community officer wandering around, interacting locally. Um, everybody had specialisations. And that became replicated in UN missions, um, in that they wanted the HR specialists, uh, they wanted the IT specialists, and so on and so forth. And these people were then being deployed into missions. Um, and I think particularly um, the uh, executive policing mandates uh, where peacekeepers, police peacekeepers were going out and being expected to um, do hands-on executive policing functions in post-conflict areas, um, which, um, as I'm sure this audience are all well aware of, is extremely different to um, walking their local high street and dealing with their local community. Uh, and they were being expected to do this with little training. Sorry, executive policing, can you expand on that? Right, so effectively the mandate is saying that they are to be police officers and they are to enforce the law as opposed to the normal mandate which would be um, to monitor, to report, uh, where they're not actually responsible for um, effectively executing the law in the country. So this saw a, a, a push for training um, and the C34 committee, um, who specifically look at um, um, peacekeeping, um, started to make uh, sort of rumbles about the fact that uh, there should actually be some sort of uh, training uh, which uh, should be arranged. Um, and if you look at the Brahimi report again, um, there's a key element of that which actually sort of says, yes, we need to do something about training. And it was either talking about training generally for peacekeepers or in some cases more specifically towards police peacekeepers. And I think to a degree, um, you know, equally, um, if you look at the uh, um, uh, what was happening in the Balkans, um, the, the crowd disorder and who dealt with that, was that a military function, was that a policing function? Uh, more and more in non-post-conflict countries, that was a policing function, um, certainly. Um, why should it be any different in, in, uh, in, in those that were affected by conflict? Um, so again, um, there was this need to fill that gap. Uh, throughout all of this, however, um, the argument around the General Assembly and the C-34 uh, was always that uh, any form of pre-deployment training uh, was the responsibility of the member states. Um, and to a certain extent, I suppose you can understand that because member states didn't want training being dictated by uh, the UN or any other body. Um, and therefore it, it was their responsibility. Um, of course, with that comes the dilemma, which I'll, I'll talk more about later on. Um, early training, sort of uh, around about 2000, um, they started to uh, look quite seriously into this uh, police division. Um, and the first thing that came out was a, a handbook for police peacekeepers, um, a reference material, um, which, um, Again, useful reference material, but it was just that, a handbook and, and no more. Um, what also tended to happen um, at that stage with the Member State Responsibility was that that handbook was taken 
um, and developed into some sort of pre-deployment training. Um, but of course, it was a handbook. It wasn't actually sort of much in the way of physical guidance. Um, and the other issue was that um, countries were very keen to get their officers deployed. They had to get them through the, um, the, the SAT test, uh, which was the, um, uh, the official means of having the, the tick in the box from the UN to have them deployed. And therefore, they would tend to uh, focus their pre-deployment training on passing the necessary tests to get through that, uh, rather than particularly on um, any sort of preparation for working in uh, a, a conflict-affected environment. Uh, so, um, developing on that, um, the UN then looked, or Police Division uh, specifically, uh, looked across uh, DPKO, Department of Peacekeeping Operations, for some support as to how they could develop further. Um, and I suppose the two um, key reports there, um, the Office of Internal Oversight, um, looked at uh, specifically at peacekeeping training, and again, that was across the board, not necessarily police peacekeeping. Um, and then integrated training services within the Department of Peacekeeping Operations um, specifically looked uh, at it. Um, they came up with some interesting statistics, um, and they were sort of saying that it was around about 30 odd percent of, uh, uh, of officers were receiving some sort of pre deployment training. Um, the interesting phrase there was some sort of pre-deployment training and not actually specifying what that is. And again, I go back to the comment I made earlier about preparing officers to get through the SAT test to be deployed, not necessarily preparing them for actually um, working in those environments. Um, one of the bonuses was that um, when the, uh, the Darfur conflict came to the fore, it, it became um, very much a, a, a part of the public conscience. Um, the media um, were keen to sort of uh, express what was going on there and the difficulties that, that, that were going on. Um, there was a, a push towards um, moving it from an African Union mission to a, a UN African Union uh, hybrid mission. Um, and there's someone who's, who's far more export, expert on that in the audience, um, in Doug, um, who, who was actually out there, can tell you more about that. Um, from my perspective, this is where I got involved, because I was deployed out to New York to look at um, enhancing pre-deployment <coughs> training for the, 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 the UN officers that went out there. Um, the work had actually started a couple of years before, um, but as with everything in the UN, uh, there wasn't much political drive for it. Darfur gave it um, that political drive because um, some troop characters in the police division saw that they could sort of cling on to that. They saw the interest, particularly of the donor community, um, to push forward uh, this element because one of the difficulties of Darfur was the Sudanese government's um, desire to keep it uh, an African, uh, predominantly African, deployment. Um, they were very uncooperative when it came to Europeans being deployed there, particularly in, in the police environment. So it gave the, the European donor countries an opportunity to focus on pre-deployment training um, and developing that. So um, <clears throat> that initiative um, allowed for the initial um, uh, template uh, for a course um, to be put forward through the member states, approved, and for the first time there was the guidance that could go out to the member states on what individual police pre-deployment training should look like. Um, obviously, again, still the responsibility of the member states, um, but what was then um, pulled in onto that was the uh, Association, uh, International Association of Peacekeeping Training Centres, um, because they took on an undertaking that they would assist donor countries to uh, um, uh, to deliver this training, uh, and that's the, the Kofi Annan Centre in the picture of the top right. So what, what actually was it? Um, basically, a 10-day package, um, it's based around, based around again, it's guidance, it's, it's not uh, uh, written in stone, um, and effectively, um, it was to hit um, what was then known as the standard generic training modules, um, which effectively were 
part delivered to all peacekeepers, so the military and the civilian peacekeepers were supposed to get the same. Um, and then there was some specialisation as far as police were concerned. Um, not surprisingly, uh, mm. looking particularly at human rights around arrest and detention, use of firearms, um, use of force generally, and some practical aspects, first aid, land navigation, uh, radio communications and 4 by 4 driving. Uh, so, effectively, um, that was launched in 2008. Um, and, again, because of the, uh, uh, the politics behind it and the drive to uh, increase the number of, of, of those trained, um, just within the Darfur deployment, it saw that around about 30% <coughs> figure rise to about 78% um, by the time I disappeared from the, the UN in 2010. Um, and it's, again, it still remains a member state responsibility and hence you have one of the difficulties in the fact that um, <clears throat> uh, it's not, it's still not a requirement. Now, you may say it should be a requirement that every police peacekeeper gets this before they deploy. Um, the problem is um, that um, Certainly, mission managers uh, at the UN are uh, being tasked to deploy vast numbers on a rotational basis. And it's not so much of getting the best, it's getting what they can. And there is still an awful lot of deployment uh, where people haven't been, had their pre deployment training. Okay, that's the individual police officer. I'm just going to quickly whiz through four police units. Um, <coughs> Again, um, a relatively new concept to, to UN peacekeeping, um, although if you look at the very first deployment of Ghana to the Congo, they were effectively doing crowd control and you could say they were the first formed police unit. However, in, in uh, what we recognise as a formed police unit today, um, probably again going back to the Balkans and uh, the, what was first known as the, the MSUs or mobile support units, um, which tended to be um, carabinieri or gendarmerie, um, paramilitary, um, and they sort of slowly morphed into the formed police unit. Uh, one of the things that brought them to light was the incident you'll see in the, in the picture at the bottom there, um, which was when a formed police unit um, was dealing with a, uh, a crowd disorder in Kosovo, uh, and you can see the officers there, they're dis discharging um, rubber bullets via shotguns into the crowd um, and uh, that uh, led to fatality um, and it was subsequently discovered that uh, the weapons hadn't been authorised by the UN and the ammunition was out of date. Um, that obviously prompted um, a lot of questions about uh, what's an FPU, uh, what does it do um, and uh, what should we be doing about actually training them? Um, I mean, one of the key questions, what's an FPU? Um, as I say, uh, when they started, um, it did tend to be um, the Carabinieri, the gendarmerie who were supplying them. Um, what soon came about was the fact that the precept for deploying a, a formed police unit um, that a country gets from the UN is exceedingly high. Um, if you can manage to persuade several donor countries to provide you with all your equipment, then your overheads are very low for the return on investment. And certainly uh, a, a senior police officer from a country that will remain nameless had a discussion with me when I was in New York. And he said, this is fantastic. On the back of the first two FPUs I've had deployed to the UN, I can recruit and, uh, and deploy a third one. Um, so effectively they, they were becoming um, you know, self-sufficient cash cow for that, this country um, to deploy. Now, what he did in the way of training them, I'm not quite so sure. Um, where you have um, Carabinieri gendarmerie units that train together, work together, are used to doing crowd control and, and uh, uh, firearms and, and high level policing, um, that's fine. Um, I did a monitoring and evaluation process in Darfur where I uh, visited a unit and discussed with the commander and said, so where do your officers come from? Oh, all over. So when do you train together? Oh, we, we train together um, before we deploy. 
And of course, what he was basically telling me was that, um, you know, this officer came from this village, that officer came from that town, that might be a traffic police officer, that might be a community police officer. They were all put together and deployed as a formed police unit. Um, so there were some sort of cracks in the system as far as formed police units were concerned as to what they are, what they were. Um, and and I, I give that example at the bottom there, that was, uh, I was engaged in training some units for deployment to Darfur, um, and that officer there is clearly well experienced in using the AK-47, you can imagine what happened when he pulled the trigger. Um, he learned that. Um, this, uh, this started off um, uh, proficiency in testing teams um, going out to review what four police units were doing in, in uh, UN missions and, and how effective they were. Um, the results were not good. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that, that was decided was that there was a need for mobile training teams to go out because the, the proficiency testing teams were meant to go out, test the FPUs, see what they were like, um, and then come back and report. What they actually found was that when they were out there, they were having to train them up because they were so poor. Um, the report that came back, um, they actually identified one unit that was so poor that it had to be returned to its, its member state country there and then uh, because it was a danger to itself and the UN mission. Um, so, um, mobile training teams uh, obviously were seen as a sticking plaster. Um, and a curriculum was needed um, in a similar way to the, uh, the, the individual officers. Um, the first mobile training team course was run in Moscow, um, following uh, a pilot that had gone out to Liberia. Um, and again, um, that is actually um, a group of the uh, member state subject matter experts that were, um, got together in an interesting place called uh, Fort Indian Town Gap um, in the US. Uh, where we all got together and discussed how we put something together that would be accepted uh, internationally. Um, because as you can imagine, um, uh, you know, as, a, as a UK um, uh, individual sort of looking in, the form police unit um, curriculum is predominantly gendarmerie based. So it is very, very different to the tactics that we use in the UK. Um, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Um, you know, it, you could debate. Uh, the difficulty is that if I'd sat there and said, no, we must use the UK model, um, we'd still be having a debate now. Um, they also formed a doctrine development group to look at the subject matter experts' um, opinions and decide on uh, what actually went forward. Uh, that was interesting. That was the, the final meeting of that when we ratified the new policy on FPUs. Um, and the curriculum, <coughs> um, because you still had um, member state uh, representatives who were specifically looking at, at their country specific um, details. There was, there was one, uh, I chaired the training subgroup, and there was one individual on that whose country deployed people in form police unit type units um, and was adamant that they, they wanted to change the policy because the policy that was coming out was that officers who were going to deploy in form police units should actually have somewhere around two to five years experience as police officers before they deployed. Um, in this individual's country, um, the first thing they did when they took their officers out of training was put them in form police unit type units. And because he wanted to deploy foreign police units, he wanted us to change the policy so that it said that there'd be no service level um, they could we could just deploy them straight off. Uh, falling out of that was train the trainer program, which we then, because the curriculum has been constantly running, we looked to develop that over time. Um, and uh, we ran uh, two courses, one in India, one in Botswana. And although I've now come off the project, um, they are looking to run another one, I think, later this year um, as part of that program. The idea behind that is, is train the trainer so that member states send their trainers, they get the UN stamp of approval, they then go back and train their home police units in their countries. Again, going back to the member state responsibility. Um, the curriculum is very similar. It is the individual police deployment curriculum, almost identically. But on top of that, there is a crowd control, a firearms, and a command staff module, which are, which are added into that. Um, I've just talked about those two 
fairly generic models, and there is more, there's specialization, there was a lot of work done on um, um, gender-based violence training, um, uh, and that's still ongoing, and the UN is looking to sort of have a, um, a reserve of officers who've had that sort of training, because it's, it's more and more an important skill in a, in a peacekeeping operation. Um, I haven't gone into that into, into great detail. Uh, the UN itself is developing a, a strategic doctrinal framework and training will be part of that and again that's ongoing as we speak. Um, and um, pre-deployment training for all, well that would, that's utopia. Will we ever get there? I think from, as I mentioned earlier, probably not um, because um, the poor mission manager has the limits and has the, uh, the push which is saying um, you know, we must employ X number and therefore they will accept what they can to get that number. And I'm very mindful of 20 minutes, so... Uh, Perfect timing. Thank you very much.